The following program is sponsored by CBN. Today, a former Fox News host is back with a new mission, and this time it's personal. Eric Bowling shares how he's working with the president to end the opioid crisis. Then, two former addicts. Meth makes you not care at all. Everything just started snowballing out of control. Who miraculously beat the odds together. They tell us only 1% make it, and by the grace of God, we have. On today's 700 Club. Well, it's a new week, and this is the 700 Club, and we're so glad you're here with us today. Well, it's a hot topic in Washington, an adult film star's story about her alleged encounter with Donald Trump in 2006. And this is 2018. 18. That's a, a number of years ago. And this suddenly is a hot story. Well, how will the president's supporters react? Everybody wants to know. Well, the Stormy Daniels interview came as conservatives are upset about something else that just happened in Washington, a huge new government spending bill. Jenna Browder brings us the story. President Trump returned to Washington after his weekend at Mar-a-Lago as 60 Minutes aired its highly anticipated interview with Stormy Daniels. I'm not 100 percent sure on why you're doing this because it was very important to me to be able to defend myself. The adult film star laid out the details of her alleged 2006 affair with Trump. And you had sex with him? Yes. She says she was intimidated in an attempt to keep her from talking publicly about her one-time sexual encounter. And a guy walked up on me and said to me, leave Trump alone, forget the story. And then he leaned around and looked at my daughter and said, a, a beautiful little girl, it'd be a shame if something happened to her mom. And then he was gone. Daniels got a $130,000 payment from Trump's lawyer to stay silent days before the 2016 election, which may be considered an illegal campaign contribution. And she signed a non-disclosure agreement, but she's tried to invalidate that. Trump denies the allegations, as many evangelical leaders stand behind him. Family Research Council President Tony Perkins telling CBN News Trump should be judged on his behavior and accomplishments in office. Well, to date, what has the president done? Well, the president has not engaged, to our knowledge, and I think we would know, any of the behavior that he did in the past prior to the election. What he has done is he's actually followed through on political promises. And it remains to be seen what political impact, if any, the Daniel story will have. And Washington has also been talking about another major development here, the huge spending bill the president grudgingly signed Friday after threatening to veto it, something he defended Sunday, tweeting that it restores our military, creates jobs, and includes money for the border wall. But many conservatives are blasting the $1.3 trillion measure, which more Democrats in the Senate voted for than Republicans. Trump says he had to do it, but he promises it was a one-time deal. I will never sign another bill like this again. I'm not going to do it again. Conservatives not only worry about this spending bill, but many point out the national deficit is expected to start growing again. The national debt could go from 21 to $30 trillion in the next several years. In Washington, Jenna Browder, CBN News. Thanks, Jenna. Just think of that $30 trillion, maybe as high as $40 trillion. Will there come a time, and I think it will, ladies and gentlemen, if there's one area that the United States can falter, that is in this overspending. The, 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 the people, the Congress just acts like money just comes out of some magic and it's just going to keep on flowing. Well, it won't. And sooner or later, you have to pay off your debts or you go into default or you default on all these huge loans that are out there and suddenly you're Faith and credit is gone, and people won't owe you money anymore. And then the country has to be in an austerity mode that is going to be very painful for everybody. It's a question of how soon the chickens, if you will, will come home to roost. And it's going to be sooner than you think. Well, in other news, the Trump administration and China are trying to find some solutions to stop the threat of a trade war. So maybe the president's well, bluff and bluster is working. John Jessup has that. 
Well, Pat, the two countries are trying to ease trade tensions after the president imposed sanctions on China over its trade practices. China and the United States are quietly negotiating to prove American access to Chinese markets. The Wall Street Journal reports Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin and the U.S. Trade Representative here in Washington are leading the talks from the American side. The U.S. wants China to cut tariffs on American cars and for U.S. businesses to have greater access to China's financial sector. The stock market sold off heavily at the end of last week, in part over concerns of a growing trade battle between the U.S. and China, although many analysts expected the market to rebound. Well, after hundreds of thousands of students rallied across the country Saturday demanding tougher gun laws, will there be any lasting political impact? March for Our Lives marked the largest youth-led protest since the Vietnam War era. Teenage demonstrators demand, demanded an end to gun violence and mass school shootings, and they promised to vote out lawmakers who refused to take a stand on gun control. Six minutes and about 20 seconds. In a little over six minutes, 17 of our friends were taken from us, 15 were injured, and everyone, absolutely everyone, in the Douglas community was forever altered. Everyone who is there understands. Everyone who has been touched by the cold grip of gun violence understands. Analysts question how long the students will be able to keep up their political momentum. Early estimates put the crowd size here in Washington at five to 600,000, but CBS reports one analytical firm said it was closer to 200,000. And Pat, with 800 events both here in the United States and internationally, still a strong showing. I congratulate these young people on the stand of this nature. God bless them. The truth is, though, that gun control is not going to stop the violence. There are about 300 million guns in the possession of people right now. What they really need, of course, this uh, bump stock bill is important so we won't have automatic weapons. And these shooters, but what has been suggested is probably the answer is to have people on the other side that are armed. These terrorists are cowards, and they only want to shoot unarmed people. And all of a sudden, if the people begin shooting back and they get killed, then they won't want to do it as much. And, you know, we've talked about peace through strength, and you want to have peace, the best way to do it is to have strength. And uh, But the idea of re restricting gun purchases, I mean, it's not going to do any good, but again, I congratulate these students from getting out and, and protesting. God bless them. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a good step forward in our democracy. John? Pat, President Trump has issued an order bolstering his move to ban most transgender troops serving in the military except under, quote, limited circumstances. His decision is expected to face legal challenges. In a memo to the president, Defense Secretary Jim Mattis pointed to what he called substantial risks when allowing military personnel who want treatment to change their gender or question their gender identity. But civil rights advocates say they'll fight the move, which could go to the Supreme Court. Well, American adults are fatter than ever. Nearly 40 percent of adults are now classified as obese, according to a new report in the Journal of the American Medical Association. The report also says nearly 8 percent qualify as severely obese. That comes as another new study indicates obese people die younger. Reuters reports it also showed that even people who are just considered overweight are more likely to have heart disease. Obesity and being overweight have also been linked to a variety of other diseases, including diabetes and some types of cancer. Pat, this is no new news for you. It's no news, but ladies and gentlemen, we've got to change what we eat. You know, if we just eat fruit and vegetables and stop eating processed food, but you look at the big killer, in my opinion, is high fructose corn syrup, which is in almost everything. I got a little container of applesauce. I like applesauce. And lo and behold, I was reading the label, high fructose corn syrup in the applesauce. Well, it's in everything. And you don't have to have too many hamburgers, too many uh, French fries, too many of these uh, fast foods, and all the things that go along with it. And the next thing you know, you're obese. And all they have to do is, is start eating fresh fruits and vegetables, and all of a sudden the weight will go off. But 
Terry, it's terrible. Forty percent of adults are now overweight in America. Well, we're also a very sedentary society. Yeah. You know, we sit a lot. So people are wearing Fitbits and trying to stand up at the right time, move at the right time, and eat eat differently. It really requires well, a lifestyle All change. you got to do is, is work out about 20 minutes a day or something like that. But I'm a great fan of the Total Gym. I think that is the most wonderful thing. You get on that thing, and they've got 70 different exercises that are available. So you can do uh, bicep curls. You can do squats. You can do all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And it's so easy. You don't have to go looking at other things. But um, it's, it's just this diet thing. Uh, and when you go to a grocery store, go around the outer edge, and that's where they have the fruits and the vegetables. <laughs> just, avoid the middle. <laughs> avoid the middle. In every I mean, way. It's, it, but it's, it's so simple, and the weight goes off like you couldn't believe it. It's good advice. Well, I've got good advice because I'm, I'm a living example. You've done it, yes. I've done it. And our producer, you know, uh, Edie Wasserberg is just fantastic how, many, how she, good she looks. And she's on to this eat a pound of greens a day or something. Wow. Every day, every morning, I mean, a pound of, of all these green things. So you're adding something new to your <laughs> regimen, right? right. <laughs> okay. Well, coming up next, former Fox News host Eric Bowling talks about America's opioid crisis, how he's working with the president to fight it, and why he takes this crusade so personally. From prescription pain relievers like Oxycontin and Vicodin to street drugs like heroin, opioids are killing Americans at an unprecedented rate. Ben Kennedy has this look at what's being called a public health emergency. It's a growing epidemic that claims 116 American lives every day. That alarming statistic on opioid drugs prompted President Trump to call for the toughest punishment possible for those who traffic drugs. But if we don't get tough on the drug dealers, we're wasting our time. Just remember that. We're wasting our time. And that toughness includes the death penalty. The CDC reports opioids were behind more than 40,000 deaths in 2016 alone. The Trump administration declared a public health emergency last October and renewed that declaration in January by authorizing funds to buy equipment for U.S. Customs and Border Patrol to stop drugs like fentanyl and heroin from entering the country. 90% of the heroin in America comes from our southern border, where eventually the Democrats will agree with us and will build the wall to keep the damn drugs out. President Trump doubled down on his promise by securing $6 billion to tackle the crisis, with plans to release anti-drug commercials and even provide Narcan, which counteracts drug overdoses, free to schools and colleges. Ben Kennedy, CBN News, Washington. Well, author and television personality Eric Bowling is joining us now. He's recently dedicated his time and efforts to fighting the opioid crisis. Eric, it's so good to have you with us. God bless you. God bless you, Pat. Thank you very much. You, you called, you reached out at, at a very important time in my, in my wife's uh, struggle through this tragedy. And thank you for praying with us. Well, I, I knew how dedicated you were, and I wanted to be with you if I possibly could. Um, let me ask you this opioid thing. You know, you're not just doing it as a public service. It's much closer to home, isn't it? Yeah, so um, September 8th of last year, just a little over six months ago, um, I had just gone through a separation with Fox News, an amicable separation, and I, I decided to take my wife out for a dinner. So we go out to dinner and uh, have a, just to talk about the next phase and just kind of celebrate moving forward. Um, on the way home from dinner around 1030 at night, uh, my wife was driving. My cell phone rang. And as a parent, you just it's just one of those things. You just don't feel feel good when an unsuspecting call comes in at that hour. Um, sure enough, on the other side of the phone was a young man who was panicking, who said, Mr. Bowling, please call Kayla right away. Now, Kayla was a, a girl. He, Eric was a sophomore at University of Colorado. Mm -hmm. Great student. Second year uh, of school. Terrific grades. 
Um, no indication of anything. Anyway, Kayla was crying when, uh, I, when I called, and I went right to the question. I don't know why, but I said, is Eric Chase still alive? And she said no. My wife had pulled over to the side of the road. She was listening to this, and she literally, Pat, opened the door and spilled onto the roadway. Oh. I had to walk around. I picked her up, and we sat alongside the road for a while and just, I don't know, even know if we even uttered a word for the better part of an hour, and we just sat there and just, your, your world, when you think you know what your next few steps are going to be, mm -hmm. and you live your life that way, you realize at that moment you have no control of what the next step is going to be. Yeah. So point is we we've gathered ourselves we got to Colorado the next morning um, and something that I hope no parent ever has to do or few as few as possible we met with a coroner um, about Eric's passing as we're going to meet with the coroner we're sitting with our doctor mm -hmm. um, Dr. Todd phenomenal guy in, in Colorado and Boulder um, the phone rings and it's President Trump and he says Eric and I've been friendly with with president for a long time President Trump says, Eric, I, if I, there's nothing I can do to, to make this feel better right now, but just know that you have my support. And I said, thank you very much, Mr. President. Very important phone call. Um, in the weeks following that, Pat, you were amazing. You reached out to us when yeah. we needed, we just, we were in the depths of grief and we didn't know where to go. And you and I sat on the phone several times and prayed. That's right. Thank you for that. Thanksgiving, a couple weeks later after that, uh, we're about to sit down at the Thanksgiving table and the, the turkey's on the table. It's a very small group of family and friends. And there's that, that, that empty chair that everyone talks about. And we know it's about to happen. And I see it coming. We're walking over to the Thanksgiving table and the phone rings again. And it's President Trump a second time. And he said, look, I'm just thinking about how this is the first holiday without your son. Anything I can do, uh, let me know. And I realized at that moment that President Trump has compassion he is caring. He cares about, he has empathy for people who are going through what we, and my, my wife and I are going through, which is losing a child to, to something like what we lost Eric Chase to, which ended up being an accidental overdose of an opioid. Mm -hmm. He was at college. He took a Xanax, which apparently I didn't know this until now, but a lot of college kids do to relax on campus. Now, this Xanax happened not to be prescriptive. It was laced with fentanyl. It was a Chinese knockoff that, that was produced in China, but it had fentanyl in it to make it stronger. Fentanyl is a very, very strong opioid. Yeah. The problem is um, when there's too much of it, I mean, even a tiny, tiny drop of fentanyl can be an overdose dose. Mm -hmm. He took it. He passed. So I said, Mr. President, on the phone call at Thanksgiving, I said, next time I'm in D.C., can we sit down and talk about this scourge that's, that's killing thousands of Americans? And he said, absolutely. So since then, I've worked with the president. A little piece of that video that you showed was from the White House Opioid Summit, yeah. where it's a new push to, to create awareness across the country on what a terrible uh, disease this is. It's an epidemic sweeping the country with uh, the target of, is our young people. Mm -hmm. There are people who are 13, 12, 13, 14 years old who are dying from opioid overdoses. So there's a, there a couple of things that have developed in, in, the, in the six and a half months or so since Eric's passing. Uh, I don't want to be the expert, but I feel like an accidental expert. I think parents really need, Pat, to, to say, remove this, this whole not my kid syndrome. Not my kid syndrome is killing kids because parents think their, their son or their daughter is too popular or too smart or too athletic yes. or too white, black, Hispanic, rich, poor, gay, straight. It doesn't matter. Your kid can be touched your kid can be touched by the opioid uh, epidemic. Sure. And the other one from the kid standpoint, I don't think a lot of young people realize that one pill can kill. And that's what happened, unfortunately, with our son. He took a pill and it was one pill and he, he didn't wake up. And, well, and we're, we're grieving tremendously. Haven't some of the uh, big drug companies been pumping these pills out by the tens of thousands? Millions, millions. millions. There was. Uh, Joe Manchin in West Virginia talks about a town in West Virginia where there the population of 1,000 people in the town, yeah. but legal opioids, legal pills were delivered uh, to the tune of 9 million pills in one year to that town. Now, clearly those people aren't taking them. What they're doing is they're redistributing them, a lot of times illegally, sometimes legally, but they're, it's a multi-pronged uh, problem. So Big Pharma is a problem. Yeah. Why, do, why does Big Pharma have a sales force to sell pills to doctors? Shouldn't the doctors tell Big Pharma how many they need instead of Big Pharma saying, well, hey, you, you should sell more? It's tied into heroin, and then, I mean, it's, it's a serious drug. I mean, it's really a powerful drug. It's powerful, but I tell you, it's, it's, and what we've found or what I've found 
It's the fentanyl. It's not even the Oxycontin. Yeah. This fentanyl is being, it's, most of the fentanyl in the world is produced in China, and it's coming over here legally and illegally. Pat, the, the U.S. penny is about three grams. The yeah. weight is wow. about three grams. There's enough, if, you, if that weight of fentanyl could kill a thousand people in one U.S. penny, that's how little fentanyl it takes to overdose someone uh, on fentanyl. So this stuff is coming over here, and, and illicit dealers are mixing it with other types of drugs to give it more potency. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they'll put too much in, and they'll put, they'll, they'll put lethal doses out there. So there are a lot of things that we can do to, to kind of scale back on, on some of these opioid deaths. I think the president is doing a great job from the enforcement side. Mm -hmm. So he wants to close up the border. He wants to build a wall, stop some of the, the fentanyl is being uh, sent through our U.S. postal system. Um, Homeland Security is looking at ways to stop you know, the, the drug dealers from sending it through our postal system. My goal was to talk to parents and talk to kids and say, from the, from the kid's standpoint, have that discussion with them. Let them know that they, they take one pill and they don't know what it is. It might be the last thing they do. And parents, you have to realize, your kid, I don't care if he's the, the captain of the baseball team or she's mm -hmm. the prom queen or straight A students, they're still susceptible. They're still at risk. By the way, are you going back on television? I hope you do. I will let the Lord uh, light that path. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I would love to, but right now, the, you know, this is an important uh, calling okay. for me. Well, it's so good to see you. And I've, Thank you. So, you. You've been a godsend to us. Well, you're a dear friend, and I'm, I just wish you the very best. So Thank you. Thank you for being with us, Eric, and may the Lord lead you in the right direction. I know he's going to, so... I'll, I'll report back. <laughs> <laughs> Eric Bowling, ladies and gentlemen, a wonderful friend and a great father, and thank goodness that he's doing something for our nation. Terry, what's next? Well, up next, a husband and wife who were married to drugs. With pain pills, the addiction became worse. Within four months, I was a full-blown heroin addict. We were both shooting up. Meth makes you not care at all. Only 1% of marriages make it with both spouses drug addicted. See how this couple beat those odds when we come back. Drug addiction ravages the lives of Steve and Melissa Ray. Steve started with pain kill and quickly escalated to heroin. Melissa was hooked after her first shot of methamphetamine. The day they met, they were both shooting up. And later, when they married, no one believed that marriage would last. Imagine a marriage with both spouses surviving drug addiction. They told us only 1% make it, and by the grace of God, we have. I'm Steve Ray, and I know redemption. I'm Melissa Ray, and I know hope. I grew up in a dysfunctional family. My dad was a raging alcoholic, and he abused my mom. They divorced when I was in sixth grade. I started drinking, I even started doing cocaine in ninth, tenth grade. And I quit high school, and I got married at 17 in Vegas. That lasted three months. By the time I was 16 years old, I was a licensed AMA professional motocross racer. And it's a very technical sport. One little mishap here, one little turn there can put you in, in grave danger. It's a roller coaster ride and it is a parallel to my life. I started running around with different people. Even into the marijuana, I noticed that it really started changing the person that I wanted to become. In 2001, the cycle of drinking and marriage continued for Melissa. I met my second husband when I was 21 in a bar, drinking, got married. I had my beautiful son. We just kept drinking throughout our whole marriage. Mine escalated. I couldn't stop in the end, and it ended in a divorce after 14 years. My first marital relationship, it was adulterous. She was married. She divorced her husband. We ended up together. Um, I knew from day one it was doomed. Within a year of marriage, we were divorced. The end of my second marriage, our divorce and everything, it about killed me. And I obviously didn't cope with it well. My pain was so deep, deep, deep. I was drinking. I met a guy that said, hey, you want to do some meth? 
And I tried it and I was hooked. After my second marriage, I ended up with another girl and there was constant infidelities on her side. Everything just started snowballing out of control. Started with pain pills. The addiction became worse. Within four months, I was a full-blown heroin addict. I was in and out of jail. Ended up living under a bridge and wherever I could land. It was such a cold, dark time in my life. I'd lost all hope. Then I met Steve in 2007. I found somebody stronger than I was. It was on the 4th of July. Her boyfriend's brother asked me if I wanted to go party. So we showed up and out walked to Melissa. And I just was in awe of how beautiful she was. And we were both shooting up. I felt like I lost my son because he didn't want to talk to me. There was nothing left to live for. And so I just medicated. Meth makes you not care at all. I was so high out of my mind, I didn't know what to do. So I ended up in jail in that cell by myself. I realized I wanted to give myself to God. I fell to my knees and I asked God's forgiveness. God put a picture into my heart of what my life was going to turn into with Melissa. We got married and we had Stevie. Um, he told me about the vision that God gave him. With Steve now out of jail and growing in his newfound faith, both he and Melissa confronted their addictions. I hit my rock bottom and I begged God to please, please take this addiction from me. And he did. The next morning, I had no craving, nothing ever since. And it's been almost six years. So God is amazing. It was a beautiful sunny day and I followed my dog out all the way across into a cemetery. I ended up at the statue of Jesus, fell to my knees, cried and prayed and begged God to change my life. Please take this addiction away. Everything started coming together. I put addiction behind me and I was, I was moving on. I thank him every day for everything he has done for us because that's a miracle to addicts, getting clean and sober together and staying together. After 30 years of addiction, I thought there was no hope for me at all. Everything that I have to this day, I owe to God because I could not stay clean and sober two days without God's help. Not until I went through all the things that I went through and God entered my life did I ever really understand or know what love really even meant. God is my everything. He saved me from the pit of hell. God has made me into a new person. He's a father I never had and I can trust him. I finally realized that somebody loves me and it's him, our father in heaven. I can do anything with him by my side. I was reading in Ephesians today where the Apostle Paul said, I'm praying that you might know the power of God and the unsearchable riches of his love toward you. You know, we have no conception of how much God loves us. And the Apostle Paul said, I'm praying that you might get to know that, that you might know how much God loves you. So Steve and Melissa began to understand the love of God. And the Bible says they were chosen before the foundation of the earth, that they might be one with Christ. And you know, God has a plan for you in your life if you just realize how much he loves you. These people had wasted their lives away. They had wasted their lives. They were addicted and it looked hopeless. There was no way out. But there's always a way with God. Now, what is your problem? Are you addicted to painkillers? Are you addicted to heroin? Are you addicted to cocaine? Are you addicted to sex, to pornography? What is hooked? What has hooked you? God says, look, I'm greater than all these things. I am in charge of everything. And Jesus Christ said, all authority in heaven and earth is given unto me. I've got it all. And he said, look, I'll come and take you free from the stuff. I'll get you free. Do you want to be free? Ask him, and he can do it like that. It won't take a lifetime. It won't take a big rehab. 
He won't take a, you know, detox and all that stuff. He can do it right now. Would you like to be set free? The Lord says, you have no idea how much power I've got. <laughs> Just let me show you my power. So if you pray with me right now, you will see the power of God. So I want you to bow your head, pray these words, and don't be afraid. Just pray these words. Jesus, that's right, wherever you are, these words, Jesus, I know that all authority in heaven and earth has been given to you. And I know that you have all power. And I want to come to you and experience your power. Lord, you know the things that have enslaved me. And I ask that you will break those chains right now. I ask that you will set me free that you will come into my life and bring deliverance. I call upon you, Jesus, and I can affirm that you are Lord of everything. And I thank you, Lord, that you've heard my prayer. And thank you that you've come into my life. Now, if you prayed that prayer with me, I just want you to know that the Lord has heard it and he'll set you free. But you might need a little help in going down to the next level. We have something called a new day. There's a CD in here that I think is very important. It outlines what happens next. What if you do sin after you've come to the Lord? Well, it says what you do here. What about uh, has happened to you? If anybody's in Christ, he's a new creation. It's all in here. I'll send this to you free, along with a little booklet that explains what's in here. All you have to do is call up and say, look, I just prayed with Pat. I am free, and I want to stay that way, and I want that book, A New Day. It's just toll-free number, 1-800-707-000. There's no financial obligation whatsoever. It's all free. The price of your salvation was the death of Jesus Christ and the suffering he, he had on the cross. That's what paid the price. There's no amount of money you can pay for that. So pick up the phone and call and say, I just found the Lord. Somebody's here who loves you. and will be thrilled at that. And the Bible says, there's joy before the angels of my Father over one sinner that repents. The angels are praising God because of you right now. Call 1-800-700-7000. And of course, 1-800 is out of the area. If you're in this immediate area, just dial 700-7000, okay? Terry, what's next? Well, coming up, a sex therapist lays it all on the line. I believe that God created us as sexual creatures. Nancy Houston offers hope and help for couples struggling with intimacy. That's later on today's 700 Club. Welcome back to Washington for this CBN News Break. Members of the First Baptist Church of Dallas took to the streets Palm Sunday night to boldly proclaim Jesus Christ is the only hope for our nation and the world. Thousands walked in the march for eternal life throughout downtown Dallas. Gospel artist Sandy Patty led the crowd in singing the hymn, How Great Thou Art. Pastor Robert Jeffers told the crowd, quote, we're here to proclaim our faith in Jesus Christ. We believe that God loves us. He doesn't hate us. He loves us and wants us, wants rather, to offer us the greatest gift of all, the gift of eternal life. Well, following Gordon Robertson's visit to Calvary Temple in India last year, the church's children ministry has grown by using CBN's Superbook curriculum. Calvary Temple is India's fastest growing church and was experiencing a huge need for innovative and engaging Sunday school material. CBN's Superbook team in India stepped in and trained the church how to use the curriculum. Now Superbook is being used to teach over 8,000 children at five different services at Calvary Temple. And you can find out more about what CBN is doing around the world by going to cbn.com slash international. We'll be back with more of today's 700 Club right after this. couples who have sex regularly live longer, they enjoy a deeper connection, and let go of annoyances more easily. 
So why don't husbands and wives have sex more often? Well, take a look. The Bible tells us that God created sex as a gift to bond a married couple together. But today's culture has corrupted God's plan. Christian counselor and sex therapist Nancy Houston wants to change that. I believe that God created us as sexual creatures. In her new book, Love and Sex, Nancy uses storytelling to bring healing and insight to married couples struggling to connect intimately. Please welcome to the 700 Club, Nancy Houston. It's great to have you here. Thank you. It's so great to be here with you, Terry. Well, Nancy, obviously God had a plan for all of this. And though we know that procreation is a part of that plan, there are other deep meanings to intimacy with husband and wife. And our culture seems to have just attacked that unmercifully. How so? It has. We have managed to make a real mess of things, haven't we? Yes, we have. You know, God decided to make us sexual creatures on purpose. We're made in His image, and He wanted husbands and wives to have a way to bond together. You know, married life isn't always easy, but when a husband <laughs> and wife go skin to skin and um, are intimate with each other, they release all these feel-good bonding hormones that God knew we would need to create a happy married sex life. You talk in your book, Love and Sex, about the fact that part of what makes that intimacy happen is our willingness to be open yeah. and to be vulnerable with each other. What are some of the issues that fight that? Well, there's all kinds of issues. For example, in my own life, I grew up with a father who had PTSD. He was a World War II vet. Uh -huh. And he also had a severe head injury from riding bulls in the, in the rodeo. And then he became a very successful, successful lawyer. He was a brilliant man. And he provided well for our family. And on, in the outside, we looked like we had it all together. But inside, there was a lot of trauma. He added alcohol to the mix. Wow. And so he could be physically and emotionally and even sexually abusive at times. Mm -hmm. So I grew up with a lot of trauma and it wasn't until I was older that I kind of had to come face to face with my trauma because it was keeping me from really living the life that God had for me. Well, sure. And, and how did you find healing for yourself uh, and part of what God, you, you know, the Bible says he takes what the enemy meant for evil and works it to good. And so here you are today as a sex therapist. But in order to do that, you had to work through some of your own personal issues. How did you do that? I, I really did have to work through that. You know, I got, I got help. Mm -hmm. because none of us can do this by ourselves. We really need help. And, you know, I think what people do is we keep our sexuality separate yeah. from our spirituality. We keep it separate from God. We think, oh God, this part of me is too dirty, too shameful. I've made mistakes that I'm embarrassed about. And so I'm just gonna keep that separate from you. And I think what we know about God is he's like, come to me, yeah. bring me all of your troubles, bring me all of your heartache. You know, it's during this time when I was really healing that I just meditated on Isaiah 61, where Jesus mm -hmm. said, I came to heal the brokenhearted. Yeah. And who hasn't had their heart broken? Yeah. You know, I think we don't get very much sexual guidance growing up. Yeah. And now that we know our brains are not fully <laughs> developed until we're tw at least 25, yeah. We can all make a lot of sexual mistakes. And then we feel shameful and we feel bad about ourselves. So we go into hiding, just kind of like Adam and Eve at the yes. fall. That we're was still their first it. response. <laughs> yes, we're still doing it, aren't we? Well, talk about some practical ways that people can enhance intimacy in their life, maybe move past the kind of things that they've done that they are ashamed of or that have hindered them being healthy sexually. How, what are some positive things we can do? Well, I think first of all, if you need some help, don't be ashamed, ask for help. Yeah. Put some good people around you and some people who will love you and be safe for you where you can start opening up and telling your stories. Mm -hmm. I mean, as long as it's all stuffed down inside of here, 
it will come out of you in some ways. Is that easier for women to do than men? Men seem to always have a hard time getting help professionally. It seems like there's a stigma They do with that. resist that, don't they? I think men have been taught from the time they're little boys, like, get over Deal it. Deal with it. Don't mm -hmm. be a crybaby. So they've been so, um, you know, programmed, really, mm -hmm. to feel like they should just be able to handle everything by themselves. And nobody can do that. Jesus surrounded him self with people. He knew he couldn't do life alone, mm -hmm. even though he's deeply connected with the Father. You know, so, so we need this relationship, but we also need people to get healthy. And, you know, I always say to people, get somebody safe around you. Wow. I hope the book will be a guide to help people work through whether there's sexual trauma like I had, mm -hmm. or if there's porn issues, because that's a big sure, issue. Sure, boy, we've heard about that. Haven't we? Big issue in today's Drug marriages. for the brain, right? Yes, that right. Alters People things. are medicating. You know, husbands and wives, um, well, men and women, not even husbands, men and women just think differently, we respond differently, we, sex has a different meaning to us. How do you suggest husbands and wives kind of bring that all together in a meaningful way. Wouldn't it be great if we could be sexual friends to one another and stop judging each other for our differences and really learn how to talk and communicate and realize we are different. I mean, just if we look at neuroscience, mm -hmm. men, if if like a man sees his wife getting ready, something lights up in his brain and he's like, ooh la la. And she's like, I'm getting ready because nothing lights up in her brain. We're just wired so differently that way. But it's really perfect because God knew that our differences would make it interesting mm -hmm. and make intimacy way more fun if we learn how to celebrate that instead of kind of beat each other up for it. Yeah. Well, learning how to celebrate it is what Nancy's book is all about. It's called Love and Sex, A Christian Guide to Healthy Intimacy, and it's available wherever books are sold. You can also check out our social exclusive interview with Nancy. That's on our Facebook page. All you have to do is go to facebook.com slash 700 club. Great to have you here. Thank you so much. So good to be here. Thank you. Thanks. Well, still ahead, we've got your email questions. Julie says, can you continue in the same sin and still be saved? We've got your questions and honest answers and it's all coming up. Hey. Dan was already struggling to make ends meet as a single dad to his daughter, Grace. Even so, he welcomed his stepdaughter into his home after her mother abandoned her. Dan was down to his last 60 cents when he received a hand up that tripled his income. Dan is a single father. He's been raising his three-year-old daughter, Grace, ever since his wife took her older daughter and left. But Dan has received help as a single parent from a child care center in Thailand supported by CBN's Orphan's Promise. I did not know how to take care of my daughter but the staff here gave me lots of advice. I trust them because they have taken very good care of Grace. Din had provided for their needs at the only job he could find, working part-time at an aluminum shop. Then he learned that his six-year-old stepdaughter, Omi, was going to be abandoned at an orphanage. I was shocked. I was close to my stepdaughter and couldn't imagine why her mother would leave her too. Den decided to take in his stepdaughter and raise her too. But this put a huge strain on the family finances. When I'm hungry, my tummy hurts very bad. Den remembers the day when he was down to his last 60 cents. I did not have money to buy food. So we went to my sister's house and ate a meal there every day for a month. I felt so discouraged. I wanted to do better for my daughters. Working with a local pastor, Orphan's Promise gave Den everything needed to start an aluminum shop at home. He now makes doors, windows, shelves, and other items for houses and businesses in the community. His income has tripled, and his children no longer go hungry. We feel God's love and acceptance through Orphan's Promise. Thank you for being like family to us. Oh, 
Thank you, Orphan's Promise. You know, the Bible says God puts the lonely in families, and He talks all the time about being a good father to all of us. It's not God's plan for children to go into orphanages if they don't have to. Orphan's Promise is privileged to come alongside of parents like Den who want to be good parents. They just need a little help to get over the hill, and that's what you provided if you're a 700 Club member for Den. We want to say thank you for what you do out there. You're keeping families together. You're helping children to eat, to find clothing, to be educated, to be able to dream and have a future. Thank you, 700 Club members. 65 cents a day, $20 a month makes you a member, and we want to invite you to join thousands of people who are doing just that. Our number is toll-free. That's how you join. You call 1-800-700-7000. Just tell them you want to join the 700 Club. And listen, when you do, we have a thank you for you. It's Pat's latest teaching on DVD called Answered Prayer. It is powerful. It's filled with wise counsel from the 50-plus years he's been in ministry about how to pray efficiently and effectively and how God responds to the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man or woman. So we want you to have this. 1-800-700-7000. It's yours when you call. Pat, this is from Pat, who mm -hmm. lives in Jacksonville, Florida, right. who watched Answered Prayer and says, Dear Pat, thank you for the Answered Prayer DVD. I watched it with my sister, who's been confined to her bed for eight weeks and is spacing four more weeks. It was uplifting and needed as we prayed for her healing and bound the spirit of depression. So it's touching people lives as they're listening so. to it and very watching important. it. Very important. Time right. for some questions. Let's you ready? All right. Okay. This first one comes from Julie who says, can you continue in the same sin and still be saved? Well, the Bible says if anybody is born of the Spirit of God, he does not continue in sin. It, it you know, the translation is he doesn't sin, but it, it's Greek continuous action. He doesn't continue in sin. So the answer is exactly no, you don't keep on. If you are coming to the Lord and the Lord's the Spirit is in your heart, you don't keep on. Does that mean you sin occasionally or you, you, you fall? Yes, but you, you do, but you don't keep on doing the same stuff. Mm -hmm. So are you ask the, that's the question. The answer is no, you, you can't, you know, you can't be part of the Lord's family and keep on. All right. Okay, this is Mario who says, Pat, please explain. God forgives all sins, so why could he not forgive Eve and then Adam for biting the apple? We'd all be happy right now in the garden. Well, we would. Except, you see, here's the deal. When you're in the presence of God, God was right there. There was absolutely no excuse. You know, you and I can say, well, I don't think I heard the Lord. I thought I was listening to God, but I'm not sure I did. I may not have gotten that scripture right, or, you know, you can always come up with some excuse. Adam and Eve had no excuse. God says, that here's the deal, and it wasn't an apple, by the way. When you eat the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, when you eat it, the day you eat it, you're going to die. And it wasn't that God didn't for forgive them, but God had said, the consequences of this particular act, are you will be expelled from the garden. And that's exactly what happened. He drove them out of the garden. It, it wasn't that their sins weren't forgiven, but there was a consequence. And God will tell you if you know for certain, if you do something. I mean, the law is pretty clear. If you kill somebody in cold blood here in the United States and you get convicted, you will go to prison for the rest of your life, or maybe you'll be executed. Now, that's what happens. And so God made it clear to them, the day you do this, you're going to die. And they did it. You know, and the devil said, well, you will not surely die. The devil said, don't believe God. Uh-huh. No. So that, that's why it happened. Okay. Okay, this is Joanne who says, does a Christian have to tithe on an inheritance? I was told no, but I want to hear your input. And then TW, in addition to that, says, when you get a refund on taxes, should it be tithed on since you've already tithed on the gross income? Oh, I think the inheritance is something that came to you unexpectedly. And I think if you want to be blessed, it would be, it's not going to cost you anything to tithe. I mean, you got 90% you leave. So whatever you inherit and say your inheritance is $100,000, so you give 10, you've got 90,000 left. Mm -hmm. uh, and God will prosper that and bless it. 
Now, in terms of a tax refund, you've already paid the taxes, you've already tithed, and so forth and so on. Mm -hmm. the, I don't know all the details about that, but the answer is that that's is questionable. You, you'd have to tithe that. But look, we give out of the joy of our heart. We give out of the joy of what God has done, and and you know, he that gives general liberally or will sows liberally, he'll reap liberally. So why not? All right. This is Joyce who says, the Bible says to resist the devil and he will flee from you. So why is it that the more I resist <laughs> the devil and draw closer to God, the worse things get for me? Well, I, I think the devil's trying you. And, and uh, you know, do you mean business? I don't think you really mean business. If you really resist him and you really bind his power and you really believe it, then he will go. But if you're wavering, well, I'm just not sure. I'm not sure that he's going to leave me. Well, obviously you're not sure because he keeps coming by. So you, you and I, if we have Jesus within our heart, the word we speak is the word of God, and it's as powerful as the day of creation. So you resist the devil. Satan, I bind you in the forces of evil, and you do it with the power of the Holy Spirit. He will obey what you say. We leave you with today's Power Minute from Proverbs chapter 10. The blessing of the Lord makes one rich, and he has no sorrow with it. Well, tomorrow, former atheist and best-selling author Lee Strobel makes the case for miracles. So thank you for being with us. For Terry and all of us, this is Pat Robertson saying we'll see you tomorrow. Goodbye. God bless you.